good? Yeah, well, I'm making my way over to you. All right. That's schlicky. Um, <laughs> Lauren asked me to talk a little bit more about child development, so I'm just going to do a little sort of piece here on it. And um, well, I'm the CEO of Little Works Interactive, and and uh, although I, we do some production, we're, we're mostly consultants, and uh, we help other companies create um, delightful apps and toys. And for 30 years, I've been studying the nature of engagement and children's play patterns. And that's really what we talk about is play patterns, but today I'm going to talk about other things. But we want to know, you know, what is it, what turns a simple click or tap into a magical experience? And over the years, um, I've gathered up all of that, that information um, into a book, which many of you have, and uh, we have some copies here. Um, and it, it, one of the most amazing things that I learned while writing the book was it, it was all stuff I wish I knew when I was a parent because I know so much more about my kids and helping my kids grow than I did at the time. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how applied learning theory makes better games. Sounds like an oxymoron almost, but um, learning theory uh, are conceptual frameworks that describe how students absorb, process, and retain knowledge during learning. But what I've come to understand is that learning theory is really about creating enhanced engagement. And, you know, engagement is the art of keeping attention. And that's really what we're about in, in good game design, is how do you keep kids in, engaged? And it's easy to get a child's attention once, but keeping their attention is an art form. And that's, that's really what the good game design is all about, is how do you keep them engaged? And so this is where learning theory comes in. Now, there are four uh, main learning theories and philosophies, um, and they all offer insights in designs, uh, opportunities for better designs, but, and as you apply them, the, to the, they create great interfaces, but um, it's really more interesting to look at it from the point of view of the practitioners. So uh, I'm gonna kind of jump into the people and we talked a little bit about Maria already. Now, Maria's uh, child-centered approach is structured around the child's natural desire to learn. And we all know that kids want to learn. In fact, Darren often complains that companies say, we make learning fun. And Darren says, well, learning is fun. As designers, our job is not to screw that up. And um, that's really the kind of the place here is that um, all of her work is following it, and she would follow the child's interest and support their own natural curiosity. And all kids are curious, they want to know what, what's that, what's it do, and then what can I do with it? And in software design, following the child is also part of uh, a big part of testing. It's a lot of what uh, Barbara does at her lab, is that it's really one of the places where you really get to see what are the kids interested in, what do they want to do. Uh, Hands-on learning is about multi-sensory approach often rooted from the concrete experience to the abstract, with enough time for exploration, because so, that supports the goal of student mastery. Really, mastery is the piece. And we all know that learning is stronger when students can approach the same material through various modes of interaction, rather than, say, just having someone tell you about it. So you get your hands on it, you played with it, you messed with it, you experimented with it, you saw what it could do. You're going to really hold on to it a lot longer. Um, curriculum closely based on a child's level of development. This seems like a no-duh, except that since we consult with a lot of companies, we always get products that are so off, it's amazing that they don't understand the difference between a four-year-old and an eight-year-old. And um, so it's, it's really important to have that curriculum closely based. And then um, she talked about promoting a discovery model. And we know that you know, the best products allow the kids to have more time to play. So uh, it gives you time for exploration, it gives you time for uh, mastery, and when we're, uh, I'm one of the CAPI judges, and one, that's one of the things we're often looking for in a good product is something that um, allows kids to have some exploration time. So these are all things that make great software, but I think they're also about human nature, since many learning theories were developed way before we had personal computers. So you're actually getting down into the core of the human. And Maria said, here's one of my favorite quotes for the day, uh, one test of the correctness of educational procedure 
is the happiness of the child. And other than Mr. Rogers, I think it's, it's rare to have educators talk about the happiness of the child as an important outcome of learning. And, but it's, I think it's a wonderful perspective. And I'll put that up on the wall here so you don't have to write it down. But if you have happy users, they stick around, they come back, they're gonna play more, they're gonna be loyal. And um, that's a big piece of it. Uh, another one here is, is uh, Lev Vygotsky. The zone that we talked about, Warren talked about him a little bit. This is a rare picture of him smiling, by the way. <laughs> um, and, well, he's actually uh, laughing. Isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's, he's <laughs> laughing pretty. And uh, so there aren't many pictures of Lev. But I heard that Lev is short for levity, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the zone, as Warren said, defines the, the level of task or problem that a uh, child can accomplish with collaboration or guidance with others. Uh, the chart often looks like this. With there's what they can't do on one side and what they can do alone and then what they can do with somebody else. And the zone, I believe, is the place where almost all learning and interactive media takes place. Um, smart designers know where a child is to, uh, developmentally and what's possible for them to accomplish. So the zone is where designers can support children in their efforts to go beyond what they can do and construct on their own. You know, agents and characters are one way of doing that, can be those guides. But I believe any program that tracks your past performance and follows up with a slightly more challenging activity, especially with help if needed, uh, is using the zone of proximal development. Um, Albert Bandura, social learning. And uh, Albert believed that um, people learn inside a social context, uh, often by directly observing others, and that children especially learn from their environment and seek acceptance from, socially, from society by eliminating influential models. Um, Bandura sees learning as a balance of watching and doing, a continual reciprocal interaction between cognition, behavior, and environmental influences. And we see this in software, where the kids are, you know, they watch each other play, and they're really engaged, and we've talked about it quite a bit already. But the concept of monkey see, monkey do, is really, we all know about that, we've all seen it in our own lives, we've done that ourselves. Um, but it's also true that kids learn behaviors and characters from, um, from characters or people in the media that they consume. So especially when designing for young children, it's important to create animated characters uh, with the awareness that children might learn from or imitate them. Uh, this does not mean characters should be perfect or one-dimensional because then they're really boring. Uh, they've got to have some fears and, and, and their own problems, but um, it's important to consider the implications of this because in his research what he found was that particularly he pointed out that modeling aggression had a strong influence, influence on younger children. And um, but it, when we were building, most of you see my app Noodle Words, and we built a bunch of extra words to go into Noodle Words, and one of the words in the new one was cry, and uh, which everybody hasn't seen. and. Uh, we were thinking, well, how do you know, to set up the, when you click on the characters, how do you set that up? And the one character in the initial piece, he pulled back the antenna of the other character and let it snap, and that made the little character cry. And I, it seemed funny to the animators, it seemed funny to the sound designers, and I was testing it with uh, my then five-year-old grandson, and he stopped and just froze, and he turned and looked at me and said, he heard you. Like, whoa. Wow. And then he went to do it again. And I, and I, and I realized, uh-oh, this was bad modeling. I had put bad modeling in my own product. Mm -hmm. And so what we did instead was we had him drop his, the little, the little character drop his ice cream cone and cry. And then the other character gives him another ice cream cone. So it was a whole different kind of modeling, but it, you know, I was just shocked at the impact that just that little piece had on, on my own grandson. Um, Mihal Cheek Set Me High. Cheek, cheek Set Me High. Cheek Set Me High. Cheek Set Me High. So cheek Set Me High. Um, is most often cited as the person to have refined and expanded the study of flow. Now, Mihai, Mihai rather, uh, it defines flow as the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience itself is so enjoyable that people will do it even at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. 
He's one of the major proponents of positive psychology and has devoted his professional life to the study of happiness and how people can attain it. There's a good gig for you. Um, so some of the things he talks about that apply to software is you want to set clear goals, uh, you want to support a sense of personal control. These are all things that all showed up in our, on our, our, our exercise earlier. Um, give immediate and direct feedback and uh, balance uh, the ability level and level of challenge. And this is sort of one of the things that he really pushed it a little, you know, flow is a, not a learning theory. It's a state that occurs when you get everything right. So it's the mental state that athletes, artists, and musicians often call being in the zone, where one is completely focused and engaged with the task at hand. So he, he developed this chart. And you see flow over there in the, in the right hand corner. And you have to, it has to be a balance. So optimum flow happens when challenge level meets the skill control level. So if your challenge level is too high and the kids can't do it, then they're frustrated and they leave. But if their challenge level is too low and they can do it too easily, then they get bored and they leave. But when you find that sweet spot in between the two pieces, then, then you're really right in there. You're engaged. You want to do it. It's like a great conversation. Um, we have Skinner, Operant Conditioning. And when I first started writing my book, I, I had my first uh, pass on this part of the book. Uh, I got beat up by friends because I, when I was in school, Skinner was, I considered him a rat torture. And uh, it always just seemed strange to me. But then other friends of mine said, no, no, you got him all wrong. You got him all wrong. And as I dove into it further, I learned that he was opposed to the common use of physical punishment in schools where the teachers would come and whack you um, and thought it taught kids to hate learning, which I think is true. So he developed a new system of learning. He even developed early learning machines. And he said, you need to provide instant feedback. You need to offer positive reinforcement. Uh, you need to offer individualized pacing. You need to offer incremental levels of difficulty. And offer random rewards or intermittent reinforcement. Now, it's interesting where you've got Maria and some of the others, they're often saying a lot of the same things. If you had a Venn diagram, there's really this whole piece where they all mix over, even though they're from very different schools. But some of the same information about instant feedback shows up for everybody. And over and over, so there's the things that you, you want. Warren always talks about having a crisp interface. And that these same things show up, show up, show up, show up, because they're human nature, no matter which school of theory you're coming from. Actually, I found a quote somewhere, um, or maybe you can back me up on this, but I actually thought it was PJ. It was it sort of, it was like, like Jesse's, uh, whenever you teach a child something, you prevent them the opportunity to learn it himself. And it was B.F. Skinner. And, it, you know, he had a different approach, in the uh, uh, master learning model of his teaching machine. But um, I thought, oh my gosh. Yeah, he, was, he, was, he didn't like the kids were getting hit in school. And I thought, that changed my whole viewpoint on, on how I thought about him. And um, I used uh, intermittent reinforcement in, in a, uh, most of my design, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, they, uh, I, mean, I love it because it, it, it adds random surprises that it helps kids trigger and that they find while they're exploring. So it supports their exploration, but the Unexpected delights create the desire to go further. So, um, who's ever who's played the foos in here? A few people. I figured some people have. So, um, the foos is a game that um, uses many forms of operant conditioning. Whether you know, most products actually use some forms of operant conditioning, whether you realize it or not. And foos was a, I thought was a great example. Um, it's by CodeSpark, and they break up the steps of the uh, learning of code, to learn the code um, into small and fun activities, and they offer individualized pacing, they offer incremental levels of difficulty, and they add a lot of positive reinforcement where the characters dance and stars go off and all these things every time you get it right as you solve it. But there's plenty of room for exploration. It's kind of an interesting mix of the new things we've been talking about. Um, and then we have Jean Dejean. And Constructivism is about how we, 
construct meaning uh, when we encounter something new. So one of the things he talked about was um, disequilibration. This is a word I learned from Warren. And um, assimilation, accommodation, and equilibration. So he saw that children are constantly seek to regain equilibration by mastering the new challenge and modifying their internal schemas to accommodate to the new information. So according to Bizet, children move back and forth between assimilation and accommodation all the time as they learn more and more about the world. And um, this, uh, here's a picture. Uh, it's a classic overlapping of learning theories. Uh, the boy is having a hands-on experience. Um, and besides being uh, in, a, in a, a very steep uh, disequilibration cycle, where he's having to integrate uh, this theory, he's also in the zone of proximal uh, development with uh, his dad helping. And, um, and he's right on the edge of the flow state, where the challenge and his skill level are pushing each other. So I think this is sort of a lot about how learning works is that we're right on this edge and pushing on these pieces. So then the question is, well actually here's a quote from Piaget, play is the work of childhood, uh, and I think that's so true. And so how do we apply this to software design? Well my favorite way to apply it is by surprise. And um, we all like surprises, well we like good surprises, and um, we like them so much we even have surprise parties sometimes. And, um, surprise is disequilibration in action. Disequilibration, assimilation, accommodation, equilibration. You know, oh, 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 oh. Hi, George, I think he's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm back. I think he's fine. What? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's that, that process, and they're going through it all the time. And um, I mean, I, you don't think that you like to be thrown off center, but actually, that's really what the learning from is when we're actually pushed out of our comfort zone. So, for me, I, I've been using it for years in surprise. So how do we create surprise? How does it work? You know, um, through the repetition of experience, the brain begins to make assumptions about how things work and what will work in the future. And surprise is when something unexpectedly happens, creating a mismatch with previous knowledge. And um, surprise is great for supporting continued engagement uh, because it uh, gets our attention. It supports intermittent reinforcement. Uh, it creates a state of arousal. Uh, that's how the psychological uh, the psychologists call it that. And it drives further interaction and exploration. So I, I've been, you know, surprises something just like the magic that I sprinkle in the products. Because uh, when kids find it, they just like, they light up and then they want to dive in. And also, you know, so many products say, our kids will love it because it's interactive. <laughs> and, uh, but interactive often means you click on something and it goes bloop. And the next time you click on it, it goes wrong. And the, you know, the four-year-old might click on it three times because they're, they're still learning about what it is. But the seven-year-old clicks on it once. And if it does it the same thing a second time, they're out of there. They assume the whole product, that's it. They've seen it all. But the second time it blows their mind, then they go, whoa, there's, some, there's more here than I thought about. And they're going to go further and go deeper and farther into it. So. When I began studying surprise, then I was really surprised to find out that, well, there's different kinds of surprise. So there's startle surprise. <laughs> and, uh, were you disequilibrated when you, when you saw that? So um, startle surprise is the one that makes you jump. And it talks to the ancient reptilian part of the brain. It's used in every scary movie that uh, just when you thought the monster was dead and you look back in the hole one more time to make sure and he jumps out at you again. Um, it gets us every time. In fact, um, I, I think of it as the jack-in-the-box experience. And I, you know, I love that scene in um, um, Elf, where, where Will Ferrell, is, his job is to test the jack-in-the-boxes to see if they go off. <laughs> and it's like, you, you cringe, even as he does, waiting for it to jump because you know it's going to happen. And you know it's going to happen and you jump anyway. <laughs> so that's startle surprise. And it is used sometimes in, in software. Um, another kind is a maze surprise. And the maze surprise is just like, wow, it's incredible. I just can't imagine that it happened. You know, um, the, um, sometimes called the, uh, the oh my god, oh my god, I can't believe it. You know? 
Um, the, um, and then there's the classic epic win. And epic win is really, the, uh, uh, Jay McGonagall in one of her books has all these great photographs of mostly adults at the moment of the epic win. And they're just like, <sighs> but they're all, it's all real, it's all natural. And she says, an epic win is an outcome that is so extraordinarily positive. You had no idea it was possible until you achieved it. And when you get there, you are shocked to discover what you are truly capable of. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's like transformative. And, and if that doesn't motivate you to come back and be engaged in learning or whatever it is, um, then, you've, then you've missed out. Um, another one is insight surprise. And this is not about shock as, as, as much as amazes, but this is about that brilliant flash of understanding. Um, it's the, the aha moment. It might be a kind of a mini satori, or it could be the, the moment of enlightenment. But um, you, <coughs> and uh, but it's uh, it's really about um, it's really about how things connect, and good engagement design sets the conditions for kids to make the connections themselves. And all of us who have been working with kids and trying to, especially trying to teach math or. Uh, uh, science concepts, it is really just um, delightful when the kid turns around to you and goes, oh, oh, one, one fifth, one of five pieces. You know, they just like, the lights go off. That's insight surprise. And then the last one that showed up surprisingly for me was humor surprise. And every time I look at this picture, I think it's Darren and Warren as kids, you know. <laughs> but, um, uh, we may not usually think of humor as a surprise, but it's that, that shock of the unexpected punchline uh, or uh, that makes it funny. And uh, you know, jokes have punchlines, and um, in storytelling, we have plot twists. And again, it's that, it's that piece about how the storyteller weaves a, per a perception of the specific events, gaining the listener's involvement through their imagination, and then the audience unconsciously anticipates the final arc of the story and then makes a leap to the end and what the conclusion will be, but the surprise and delight comes when the story makes an unexpected turn and winds up off the road and in the ditch. And besides being uh, contagious when you're working with multiple kids, um, humor just has a huge role, I think, in software design. It's, it's, it's really some of the magic that you can sprinkle into a product that just tickles kids. And it can be weird things. It can be uh, a bird that barks. It can be, you know, it's, it's just things that mismatch. If you expect something to happen, then you get the opposite. Um, I was, um, somebody was telling me this story about being at the circus, and the, he was, had some kids with him, and a clown came up to the kids. And the clowns are kind of scary to kids, because they're like, you know, a little weird and freaky. And, and, and the clown gets kind of up in the kid's face, and he says, um, what do you like about the circus, kids? And they kind of like all back off, like, you know, who is this weirdo, you know? But the one kid's a little braver, and he goes, well, I like the elephants. And, and, uh, and the clown goes, oh, yeah, the elephants, you know? They're the best. In fact, they're the best kissers in the whole circus. <laughs> and then you just watch the kid's face, he's saying, you know, trying to integrate kissing an elephant. Well, what part do you kiss anyway? You know, like, <laughs> all that's going on. Now talk about disequilibration. That was it right there. He had that kid, you know. It just took him somewhere else, but he was using Uber to do it. So I'm going to wrap this up because I know we're getting close to lunch. But um, all of these surprises and all of these things about learning, when you really apply the basic stuff, um, well-applied learning theories makes great games. And when you see faces like these, and like these, in your user testing, then you know you've tapped into the power of applied learning theory. Thank you.